The Pint of Science, brought to you by the Faculty of Science, Charles University in Prague, Department of Chemistry, sponsored by the Pilsner Brewery. So I'm an economist, or I pretend to be an economist. I have a degree in physics and math, actually. So I do economics, and, and I, I like it a lot, I have to say. I'll try to show you something why I think it's interesting, and it, it's also important, just like other disciplines of uh, of uh, science and, and research. And I'm from Sergi I, so a joint workplace of Charles University and Academy of Sciences. Uh, so, just like you, you know, we are interested in lots of questions. We are interested in some questions that I think are very important. Uh, how societies work, we try, we'd like to figure out how to make people ha happier how to, for instance, increase unemployment, uh, decrease unemployment, or for instance, even decrease conflict between societies, <coughs> decrease wars, and so on. So these are you know, tremendously complex and complicated questions. And perhaps, maybe if you read popular media about economics. Hello. I. Difficult to find you. <laughs> um, it, it, it seems that in, in economics, we all have very clear opinions, very often going completely opposite ways, and so on. So we who, who try to do research in economics, it's very different. So we know that we don't know a lot. Uh, I mean, we, we are very happy for every small step. So what we are doing, the methodology that we're using is that we're trying to accumulate knowledge, just like in any other field. And so we're doing lots of data gathering. We are trying to run experiments. And the other part is theory. And the theory, basically what we do, we are trying to provide testable implications. We are trying to have a model that implies something. Very often in news you would read, it's clear in economics, this is what we should do. It's not always like that. So we, should, we, we, we like to have a model that implies something. But then the model needs to be rejectable, needs to be testable. So. So economics, research in economics, is never-ending discussion between data and theory, back and forth. And gradually, slowly, we are progressing together. Uh, so what, what I'm working on, as well as lots of other people, is somehow just like in physics and perhaps uh, and in chemistry, there is an interaction on small scale and large scale, from atoms to the whole systems. Economics is a new science or new discipline. So we still don't have a good model of how the, how the element, the, the basic elements work. So we need to model, we need to find out how to, how to model and how to understand humans' behavior. And that's important to study policies, to study you know, what taxes should we have, how laws should look like. The thing is, we cannot just observe how people behave. We need to be able to predict how people would behave in a situation that we never observed before. You know, we were thinking about, should we change law in a new way? So we wouldn't have data for that, how people behave. We need to have a model outside of data that we already have. So we need a model. How to model how people behave? So last 50 years, economics typically use this optimization benchmark. It, it uh, assumed that people behave in the optimal <coughs> and the best way. There are some good reasons for that. We can, we can discuss that, that later. So this is not just... This is not that we would, so I should check time, uh, okay. This is not that we really think that people, people behave in the optimal way. Uh, it's a benchmark and it was somehow the best we could do at some point. But the, the big advantage is that in this model people adopt. That if we, if we are interested in how would people behave if we increase taxes, in that model, in that theory, we can answer that question. Not perfectly, but we, we can we can describe the adaptation of people. The problem is that, or the beauty of reality is that people make mistakes. People don't behave optimally. People do adapt, but they make mistakes. We know that from psychology and so on. The problem is typically in psychology, we have a huge list of behavioral biases, how people behave, but it's not that much about adaptation, that people would start behaving differently if we make small changes on the environment. But we know that people make mistakes, that their preferences, what they care about, are very complicated. It depends on lots of things. They care about themselves, others. They have self-control problems, and so on. We know that cognition, mental capacities, somehow play a big deal in, in all of these uh, parts of the behavior. 
So that's what I'm trying to work on. And then to take it, have a better model of human behavior and take it, take it all the way to what it implies for the whole economies. And how should we design regulation or the whole systems or democratic systems differently if we understand that people have these cognitive limitations. Uh, so that sounds great, but obviously, you know, the, don't think that we've solved these problems. We make some interesting initial steps uh, that are, I, I guess, encouraging. But so the theory I'm working on is called rational inattention. I guess in general, what it means is that so inattention that that people cannot focus on everything. Rational is that they can choose on what to focus on. Think of it as a model of directed thinking. You cannot, the agent in the model, when he's deciding how to invest, uh, where to work, cannot think about everything, but can choose to think about more important things. Does it make sense? So, so it's a model of directed thinking, selective thinking. So lots of problems, and you choose what to think about. So it brings together several disciplines. So starts with psychology, so take seriously the fact that people have limited cognition. They cannot attend to everything. They cannot figure everything out yet. So this is the twist of economics. Maybe they can choose to think about more, about more important things. You think more about inflation in the Czech Republic than inflation in Zimbabwe. Maybe you think about your wage more than about general inflation and so on. So th these are just simple examples. And then to, to model this, uh, we use framework from information theory. Information theory in computer science has some beautiful models that can describe very well what information can be communicated and what not. Just to give you an idea, this is how our models look like. In the end, there is some optimization problem. You, that's preferences. You're trying to describe what people want the best. But this F, that's just some joint distribution that describes what they do, and sometimes they make mistakes. And then there is some constraint. That's constraint on entropy for chemists that, that, that might be exciting. That <laughs> maybe they, they make mistakes, but they can limit the entropy somewhere more than, than somewhere else. Anyway, so there is some model behind that. And in the end, what emerges from this from this model is a, is a behavior. So we have a model, we have a laboratory theory, some equations. In the end, you should think of it just as a steps of logic. <coughs> it's a formalized <coughs> argument. Sometimes economists would write 30 pages of something, and then it's difficult to say where you disagree. Once you have equations, you can challenge assumptions of that equation. That, that's why we use formal language, just to somehow make, make the argument more transparent. OK. So what, what, what emerges from the model is a behavior. So if you solve those equations, that has some interesting features. So these people make mistakes. They respond to changes in the environment with a delay. They face choice overload. That means that when you're presented with lots of options, maybe it's worse for you than being presented just with two. Imagine in a restaurant. When restaurant pre-selects three types of food for you, Sometimes it's better than there is a, when there is a long, long, long menu, which classical economics cannot deal with because they're more choice, always better. Uh, and the, these people, they do, they simplify the way of thinking. They categorize. They use mental accounting. Um, I'm not sure if, if all these terms are clear what they mean. It's just they use some simple heuristics how to approach problems. But these heuristics are somehow optimal given the environment. So they change when the law changes, for instance. And it's useful for all of economics. We've been applying it to macroeconomics, finance, labor, and so on. And I'll tell you about a few applications. Any questions? Yeah. Can I throw in one? Yes. How many unopened, this has nothing to do with the organization. Uh, how many unopened and unanswered emails do you have in your inbox? Unanswered? Uh, unanswered emails in your inbox. I have zero. How do you manage? <laughs> but you, you know yourself that I don't read emails perfectly. No, 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 no. You, you, no, no. you, you, send, you no, send me email three weeks ago no, with no, information no, 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 about no, no, no. the date, and I missed that. So, so, so I agree completely. We, we don't read emails perfectly. I don't want to be disrespectful. I wanted to say, but we read emails that we deem more important. We read them in more detail. <laughs> and so on. So that's part of the model. If I ex ante view something more important, 
I pay more attention to it, but I'm not able to, um, to pay full attention to everything. Uh, so one application in labor economics, for instance, in general, discrimination is a, is a so I, I have 10 minutes? So discrimination is a big issue. It, uh, it affects happiness of lots of people, typically negatively, of lots of different groups and so on. And it's still unresolved issue, what it's caused by and so on. And it's also difficult to measure. For instance, you see wages of, I don't know, women lower. Some people would claim it's discrimination. Some people would claim it's not discrimination. So this is some, and it seems to be closely related to attention. So we did the following experiment. So while I do mostly theory, here you see some, some experiment. Mm -hmm. So we sent CVs. This is based on an experiment done in the US with some additional, we, we did the uh, twist of attention. Very simple thing. You take a CV, you send it to hundreds of firms. Hello, I'm, I'm applying for a job. And then the only thing you do, you change the name on the CV. So the CV has the same, for instance, Philip Matejka, where, where I was born, what school I went to, what my work experience is. And they, then you send the same CV with Vietnamese name or the same CV with Roma name. That's what we did to, to uh, job openings. And we found out that just changing the name decreases, for instance, from Czech name Jihai Hayek to Vietnamese, decreases the invitation rate to interview by 50%. It's extremely sad, but it's striking. So, but everything on the CV is the same. So you know, it's a nice measure of discrimination and so on. So, so th this has been done all over the world. When you said like, the Vietnamese applications were rejected, do you have any data of who are the people rejecting? Yeah, so, so we send it to hundreds of firms, and this was the average. So we do have something. No, so this is an expert. Data of those who are rejected, but those who are rejecting the firms which are rejecting the people who reject. Yeah. So, so, so we, 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 we do. No, no. So, so we don't have. We just know that they were not invited to the interview. But this is an experiment that has been done hundreds of times all over the world. Now I'll tell you the twist that, that we have done. So the idea was some people are saying maybe attention plays a role. Because if you change on the CV, education level from high school to university, you see a big difference for majority, they're invited more, but very small difference for minority. If blacks in the US, you, you, you use African American name, you change on the CV, education from high school univer to university, no difference. The hypothesis was maybe no one reads it. Once you see the African American name, you don't read the rest of the CV. It was a hypothesis. And then the explanation was a concept in psychology, implicit discrimination. The concept says that automatically when you encounter a dissimilar group minority, <coughs> you stop paying attention, always. That's, like I told you at the beginning, in psychology often fixed rules of behavior. Rational inattention, our theory would say something different. You pay more attention when it's more useful. So it means in different situations you might pay more or less attention to minorities. We did these experiments on labor markets, but also on rental markets. Hello, I'd like to come see the apartment that you're subletting. That market is very different. And we saw different results. On labor market, we saw, so what we did also, we sent CV, and the CV was enclosed in a link on the email. So we could actually monitor who clicked on the link, so we were the first who could monitor the attention. But also we did it on different markets. Uh, I don't know if you're following me, so please ask questions. So we saw on the labor market, less attention to minorities. On the labor market, when you're, when you're looking to hire just top candidate, one out, out of 100, if the first piece of information is negative, and I'm not saying that majority is worse or better than, than, than minority, whatever the, the HR manager deems to be, uh, or ages to, to be negative, then he, sa he thinks after the first piece of information, why should I read the rest of the CV if it's very unlikely that this is going to be the, first, the best candidate? So he doesn't read the CV. On the rental market, on the rental market, it, so on the labor market, only like 5% of applicants are invited to the interview. On the rental market, 80%, so more than majority. So if someone after the first piece of information looks better than average, why to read the rest of the CV or rest of the information? Just invite him. 
So on the rental market, they should pay less attention to minorities. So that's opposite to what psychology would say. Our simple model would say in different situations should pay attention to different people. And that's exactly what data showed. And then what's important is that it has completely different implications for policy. It has implications for maybe in the first stage, meaning when you're just inviting people to interview, it's enough to so this is now happening in Belgium that when HR managers are deciding who to invite for interview, there isn't name, sex, age. Then they invite them for interview. In the first stage, there is less discrimination, but you don't force them to, to hire someone who they don't want to because later stages are, are completely voluntary what to do. Or, uh, yes, so, so policy implications are suddenly completely different when you think that people adapt. For instance, Ben, you had a question, sorry. Yeah, I was just like thinking when you said, yeah, first piece of information, if it doesn't fit, um, then they just get rid of it. That's what um, Anu meant, that uh, it really depends who, well, which kind of HR team you have. Yes. Because if you have, a, um, I don't want to be discriminating at all, but if you have like predominantly um, locals, the HR team, like, for example, Czech people, middle age for Czech Republic, uh, or a bit older, and then they have to hire some people, and you have like, uh, I don't know, eight applications from abroad, and you check people, who are, will they take, or who will, like, how long will they read, they will read longer than just the name. Um, if you have a younger team, they don't care about the name, they look for the company. Qualification. So, this model that you have is a bit too much simplified. No, I, I, so I think I, I'd have to go more, more in the detail. Some of all these things are, are in the model. So, we're not saying, we're not describing who specifically wants older, younger, <laughs> but given what you want, time is scarce too. So, if you think that it's unlikely that next one minute or 10 seconds reading a CV is going to be useful for you, you don't do it. And it, but what you're saying that that's true. So there are huge effects of whether HR manager is himself or herself from the minority group. There is lots of evidence for that. They can, for instance, evaluate the minority application better and so on. But I think I'd have to go more and more in, in, in detail okay. now. OK. Uh, so for instance, so this adaptability matters a lot. Um, in the US, there are very often firms use this box that means when you're applying for a job, you have to click whether you've been in prison recently or not. And then some people view this that, well, people from prison are discriminated because if HR managers read that, even if they're fantastic, they just don't pay attention to the rest of the CV. So there were activists recently calling ban the box movement there, that, that firms should not be allowed to have this box there. That's like hiding a name. You couldn't read whether the person is male or female, so you couldn't find out whether so they succeeded, so firms stopped doing it. The implication was completely opposite. Suddenly what happened was that unemployment of young black male went up. Because they couldn't tell who was in prison, but the, the percentage of population in prison among young black male is so much higher than anyone else. Anytime they saw young black male, they just tossed the CV to the garbage. So, so these things are very dangerous, but it's super important to understand the adaptation of HR managers and firms. And this, of course, applies to, uh, to, to all of labor economics. Um, several applications that we've worked on are based on that the model describes, well, or can describe dynamic features of <coughs> macroeconomy. If people pay attention to something, for instance, they follow closely what central bank is doing, the whole economy responds faster, and so on. So you can uh, de uh, describe how GDP, inflation, and so on, how dynamic properties, better than with other models. So it's important for monetary policy, fiscal policy, for finance, lots of things. And, and then also it implies that perhaps when crisis comes, when things are more volatile, people pay more closer attention, and these things change completely. Uh, Last example, I just, just want to go through these things that it's sort of important for lots of things, is that for politics for, or for institutions. So politics, that's also something that 
economists are interested in. You can view politics or political competition in some way as economic competition. Just, just like in economics or economy, free markets are competition of products. And then we know that these markets sometimes don't work. Sometimes it's difficult to compare the products and so on. And then quality of products is not as good or price is too high than in free market. Uh, democracy is viewed as a, that it works. The, the theoretical argument is that it's the same thing. It's a competition. Politicians are trying to offer the best thing to be elected. But we see in practice that very often it doesn't work perfectly. And then it's often described as that politicians want different things, that they're corrupt and so on. But it's not clear at all whether this is the case. So if you take this model and if you just take seriously that people do not pay attention, <coughs> that for people it's difficult or they just don't want to bother spending time of what politicians do, right? I mean, how many of you read websites of different political parties of what exactly they're proposing or how, many, how much time they spent in the parliament? So once you take this seriously, you put it in the model and suddenly what emerges from this free market of political candidates, even if they are if they care about us, even if they want to do the best thing, just, be, just if they want to be elected. Let's say they want to pro, uh, support uh, laws that uh, uh, allow them to win elections. Suddenly things like populism emerges. So they're motivated to give lot to different villages and so extremism and also conflict. And th this is important perhaps because uh, if it's if some things are driven by information, changing information can be much cheaper than changing some other, other things. Also, it's important for understanding if you want to design institutions differently. In a government, what should the government do? What, it, what should it regulate? What should it not regulate? Information is super important there too. So we don't have perfect understanding for why markets are better, are better than government actually. This might sound as a surprise to you, uh, one of the best arguments is that government doesn't have local information. For instance, somewhere a businessman in Beroun understands people here want a restaurant, so he opens a restaurant. For bureaucrat in Prague, it's super difficult to, to, un, to know whether in Beroun it should be a restaurant or something. So it's based on information. But then it also implies that perhaps if we want to... So I talked about discrimination. Discrimination, that's a market failure. It implies that we should regulate things. But this argument implies that maybe we should regulate, but government doesn't really know how to regulate. We might regulate, but make a mistake. But maybe a regulation within the government, where government has better information, could be the way to go. So for instance, I would support, let markets be free, but start with, I don't know, supporting minorities, women, and so on within ministries. So why not to impose quotas there within ministries and then let private companies do something different and then let them compete and we'll see. So that, that would uh, make some things easier. Yes, I get too excited now. When I talk. Uh, then it's not as relaxed, but, you know, I just care about these things. Uh, Yeah, so, so, so this, is, this is difficult. So people look at institutions as well. So the editors and the reviewers and so on. So when we were, so this paper on discrimination actually for us, in the end we got lucky. It got published in the, in the best journal in economics. But first we were, first it was rejected in another one. We were thinking about cover letters saying something, you're not going to accept this paper because either the paper is wrong or we are right. And because you don't know us, you're going to reject it and not read it. So, so it's related to this. It's related to job market, kind of when you're hiring new students and so on. So the same mechanism, of course, applies. Just, the, just to conclude, uh, I don't know what I should conclude with. That, you know, I find these things <laughs> exciting. I enjoy it a lot. Uh, it's fun interdisciplinary research. If some of you are interested in talking more and perhaps you know, at some point you'd like to start doing something else, technical skills are always super useful and, and just skills. Economics should get more ideas from, from other fields. And what specific things that I'm interested in, this rational inattention, 
I think it's important to describe how people make mistakes because in the end we are thinking about how to help people who fall behind, who make mistakes. So if economics cannot describe behavior of people who, help, who make mistakes, then it's difficult to help them with economics. And also, you know, in the end, we are interested in how to design the system better, and that, that could help us, <coughs> I think. Am I fine with time? Or, well, Absolutely. now it's asking too late. Time, but thanks very Sorry. Much